So the title of this, I guess this is the, I'm going to call this the third podcast. Yesterday I did a, a live stream on Facebook that I didn't officially call an Arc Logos podcast. Interestingly enough, the first Arc Logos podcast was also, I didn't, I didn't determine until after it was over that it was an Arc Logos podcast. Same thing happened yesterday. So this is the first podcast in which I absolutely know uh, that this is an Arc Logos podcast. And the title of this podcast is Paul's Understanding of the Reality of Power. So some of you may know that uh, there are at at times with uh, regular degrees of frequency that I refer to myself as as a vis provusian and a vis provusian it's taken from two latin words vis meaning power and previs meaning individual i extrapolate it to free association so the the general philosophy of vis privis is that we work to tilt the balance. I don't, it's not really a philosophy. It's a, I guess it's a theory of action uh, that we work to tilt the balance of power towards individuals and free associations and away from coercive associations. So this podcast is not about vis privis. It's just about a very narrow part of vis previs. And this might be a short show. I don't know how long it'll go. And that is the vis side, the power side. So what I'm going to describe, first of all, is my definition of power. So first I'll give you my definition. I'll just give it to you. Just, just simply give it to you. Throw it out there. Power, as I'm defining it, is the ability to take action or influence the action of others. I am not intending to create a definition of power that is all-encompassing, that is all-inclusive, that is absolutely correct. It is the definition of power as I'm using it in the context of my power this Provusian worldview, if you will. So if, if we're going to look at the definition itself, the ability to take action and influence the action of others, I'm going to narrow it down even further for the purpose of this conversation and also it fits within the this Provusian framework as well. And that is, I am, I recognize that there are many factors that go into influencing action that are not human-based. So, for instance, if a wild boar is charging at you, there is an immediate, I mean, that's going to immediately <laughs> influence your next action, theoretically, unless maybe, maybe, well, it, it will, it, you, even if your decision is that I'm not going to do anything, you're you're still you're having to make an assessment based on that boar's action coming at you. So that's influencing your action immediately. Then there's you wake up one day and you discover that you have cancer and suddenly that is going to influence the type of actions that you may or may not take. And then there's the degree to which uh, physiognomy may play a part in in controlling your preferences which lead to your actions that you may or may not want to take uh, or not. I don't know the degree to which physiognomy directs your action or doesn't direct your action. So those, those are not the issues that we're dealing with here. We're dealing very narrowly with, uh, I'm going to say, purposeful action that individuals can take in aggregate or as individuals that could influence the action of others. So for the purpose of this exploration of what is the nature of power, we're looking at what is the nature of power 
within the context of how humans could potentially interact with one another and thus influence the actions of one another. That's, that's really what we're looking at here. So to recap, power, as I'm defining it here, is the ability to take action and or influence the action of others. So within that context, I'm going to break down what I believe, and this is everything that I'm sharing here is subject to review and subject to feedback. And it's, it's something that I've actually been thinking about for almost a year, maybe not quite a year, but almost a year that I've, I've thought about this theory that I'm working on, that I'm developing. I use it in my everyday life and how I observe the world around me. And I test it within those observations. It's not a scientific objective uh, uh, test because <laughs> I don't have that ability to make it completely scientific or objective. But such as I can, I try to be as objective as I possibly uh, am able to be. And, and so far, my theory has stood this initial wave of analysis. I use the way that I look at power and, uh, and how I understand the nature of power, and again, power as in the ability of individuals to take action and influence the action of, of others. Uh, I use that to analyze, for instance, on iState.tv, which is my main project, uh, all the news that I'm looking at, everything, I, it gets analyzed through this understanding of, of, the rea of what I call the reality of power. And even as I write about these things, it's reflected in my writing, this, this, this idea of the understanding of the reality of power. So I'm going to get to the four main, well, what I'm identifying so far, I've I've scaled it down to what I think are the four areas, the four areas of influence, as I call them. And there is, I'll just name them first, which is there is the social influence, there is demonstrable influence, there is ideational influence, and there is force influence. Now, there's no hierarchy here. And it really depends on individuals, the uh, nature of uh, the aggregate view of associations, the, uh, the degree to which one of these influences is coming into play, uh, what, which influence is the salient influence at any given circumstance if you're analyzing the, the interaction that's taking place. So... There's no hierarchy, and more often than not, I don't want to say this is absolutely true, but more often than not, every situation has some degree of hybridization to it. So if you're analyzing a certain interaction that's influencing action, usually, usually, you have to consider more than one of the of the spheres of influence. So, uh, uh, heirs of influence, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with spheres from here on out in this conversation. So the four spheres of influence, social, ideational, demonstrable, and force. So I'm going to go through and describe each one. And hopefully I can think of a concrete example for them. Uh, if not, then so be it. So uh, this is not, by the way, a show that I've prepared for, and I didn't really want to. I wanted to just, on one hand, I want to share my thoughts with others here. On another hand, this is a way for me to test my thoughts, to just talk and see what happens. And what I'm also hoping is that I get feedback from others and get a little plumb lining and Maybe I can refine it based on feedback, or maybe you'll re, uh, more or less uh, continue to confirm the assumptions that I have as of right now. So let's look at the first one. It's a social influence. And social influence is 
It's either positive or it's negative. And all of these influences are positive or negative. Uh, it is either going to encourage an action or discourage an action. So with social influence, that is the ability of a social structure, a, a, an association, be it coercive or free association or some combinations thereof, uh, the ability of an association that you may or may not identify with to 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 pressure you uh, through a reward, through an acceptance, or through a punishment, through a denial, through an ostracism, through a ridicule, whatever the, the case might be. So if we're looking at what's happened with the NFL, since today, as I'm recording this show today, it's uh, February 4th, 2018, this is the day of the Super Bowl, the NFL players who dared to take a knee during the National Anthem, now there was immediately some social influence that came into play. In this case, there was actually both positive and negative social influence coming from different associations. Uh, some of the associations, the social influence was was ostracism, was ridicule, was demonization. Uh, how dare you? You know, you don't you don't do that. You don't kneel for the flag. That's not cool. That is so. You know, you're you're being paid millions of dollars to play football, and how dare you desecrate our flag? Men died, and you know, appeals to morality. You know, and again, and and, and even as as you look at this, by the way, you begin to see the hybridization because there's. I'm not going to get so deeply into it with this example, but there's there's ideational influence that is happening here too, but more. What we're really dealing with is 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 the social influence aspect of this event, and on the other side, you have folks that uh, are 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 standing up and applauding and cheering and celebrating the brave actions of these uh, NFL players that that took a knee. So there was a positive reinforcement of the actions that they took and. You know, in the case of Colin Kaepernick, he is now somewhat of a rather celebrated hero in certain circles, uh, some more than others. But you know, there's a lot of doors that have opened up to him because of the actions that he took. So that's social influence. That's a very, 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 very powerful tool. You know, when you're walking out in in you know in Walmart and if 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 the uh, the very loose temporary association that is the shoppers of Walmart at that particular moment in time where you're at, uh, if 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 you were to suddenly start to sing out loud the theme to the Mickey Mouse show, uh, and everybody looked at you like, what the heck are weird debts? They just gave you the strangest eyes and, you know, you could be influenced immediately to shut up, to stop singing that song because you don't want that, even that minor, uh, mild level of social ostracism or ridicule. You don't want that. You might even decide before you even sing the Mickey Mouse song that, hey, I know this is going to happen. I ain't, I ain't even, nope, I want to sing this Mickey Mouse song, but I'm not going to do it. That is social influence, and in that case, it's 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 negative social influence. On the on the other side, you're, you're sitting in the doctor's office, and somebody, uh, you know, there's a black man sitting next to you, and then there's this white woman across the way, and there's a few other people in the room with you, and suddenly the white woman uh, uses the dreaded N word on the black man. Now. You may immediately have an ideational call to action. You may, in which it spurs you to stand up to that woman and say, 
hell's no or whatever whatever action it influences you to take. But you may not have that strong an ideational influence on you in that particular situation, or you may have social influence to bear that may pull you towards or away from the action of confronting this woman. So if you're in 1950s Alabama and the woman says the N-word to the black man, you know if you stand up and you challenge this woman, you probably have a fairly good idea that you're the one that's going to face social ostracism. But if you're in Harvard in 2018, in current year, uh, which as of the recording of this podcast, uh, you actually could have an influence. Like you may be like, well, that's not cool, but I'm not really interested. But, oh, wait, you know, if I do do this, I could be really, really uh, reinforced and recognized and loved and appreciated. I can get all kinds of positive feedback and, and appreciate. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, th that might actually push you to challenge the woman. So, th so there... That's, that's an example of social influence. So the next one is, and again, these are not in any specific order, although I am saving one for last that I'm most, I, I, I'll say that uh, I believe, not, not, not absolutely, I could be wrong about this, and not, I, I very rarely do I claim uh, absolutes, but... I strongly suspect that this last influence that I'll mention is the one influence that uh, people such as myself who, who advocate for tilting the balance of power towards individuals and free associations, that this is an area where we have the most, the, the, the greatest, I'll call it low-hanging fruit that we can pick off like immediately with the least amount of resistance but i'll get to that so now let's talk about i mean let's talk about ideational influence so ideational influence is the ideas themselves and how ideas in and of themselves have the power to influence action for instance i happen to be a christian I have a belief in Christ, I have a belief in the teachings of Christ, and I have a belief in a lot of the ideas, and I'm going to say such as I understand them, because I can't speak for anyone else but myself as far as that is concerned. So the beliefs such as I understand them uh, of Christ. Uh, and what he taught and how he kind of instructed you to live your life. So that's a powerful ideational influence in my life. I make decisions often based on, uh, I mean, uh, ideally I would always make decisions based on that, based, you know, based on my belief system, but I don't uh, because I'm, I'm not perfectly following Christ and no one else is. No one can uh, well, I believe no one can. So, so that's a powerful ideational influence, and it frames a lot of the ways in which I will choose to take action. So if, if somebody knocks on my door and uh, they, they are asking me to give them money for whatever cause. Now, when I say this, I'm not saying that, oh, you have to be a Christian to make this decision. I'm talking about me specifically and how I it might trigger me to action. So the person knocks on my door and they say, you know, I'm homeless, I need money, and, and you know, I'm looking at them and I'm assessing the uh, sincerity of their request. And I may decide, I may feel like some sort of social pressure, like, man, I don't want to be a bad guy. Uh, or, or I may ideationally be motivated in this case, that's probably what would happen. I would be ideational motivated. I would be, you know, I I live imperfectly in the love of Christ, and I imperfectly uh, attempt to express the life love that Christ has for me. It's an idea. It's an idea that I follow, and so that I that ideational influence spurred me to an action, which is to give this person money. 
and ideational influence. Unfortunately, it happens all around us in another way that many of us lament on a daily basis. Those of us that uh, we prefer to see the balance of power tilted towards individuals and free associations as opposed to coercive enterprises. So there is this powerful ideational influence that and and actually I'm I'm going to stick with uh, Christianity here for a number of Christians not all Christians for a number of Christians they they hold to the ideational assumption that you must respect and acknowledge and lift up even the authority the state that the the, the state the coercive enterprises got ordained and it must be followed. And 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 now when I'm there's a there's a lot of Christians that believe this. As a matter of fact, I would say the majority of Christians. I don't hold to this belief. But there's a lot of Christians that believe this. And I'm but I'm I'm talking about a more narrow set of Christians. And these are the Christians, they don't have other reasons. They don't have other significant reasons why they're holding on to this notion that there must always be a coercive enterprise. Their primary reason for holding on to the coercive enterprise <coughs> is this ideational assumption, belief, that there must always be a state that it's God ordained. That is a powerful ideational influence on their actions. It allows them to turn a blind eye to a lot of the parts of the coercive enterprise that fundamentally disagree with the teachings of Christ. But it's a huge, powerful ideational influence. That group of people, uh, and, and even among Christians that believe this, that group of people that I'm talking about is actually a small number in the Christian community. I, I believe, I believe most Christians hold on to the state, the coercive enterprise, for a lot more reasons than, you know, they'll cite Romans 13. They hold on to it for a lot more reasons than that, a lot more. That Romans 13 is just like that go-to excuse that doesn't, that pre pre prevents them from looking at the true reality within them as to why they actually still support a course of enterprise. But there is a small number of Christians that understand the nature of the course of enterprise that fundamentally rejects almost everything they possibly can about the course of enterprise, but they hold on to it because of Romans 13 or uh, what's in second Peter uh, <coughs> that group for that specific group the ideational influence to hold on to the course of enterprise is the powerful tool that is is preventing them from fundamentally even envisioning a world without a course of enterprise. For those folks, there's no, there's not a lot of need to 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 use social influence, and there's there's no need to influence to to use force influence on them, none whatsoever, because they're they're. I'm not trying to rebel. Hey, you ain't got no problem with them. No need to call out the guns to keep them in line. None whatsoever. So ideas I, or the ideational influence, e even if we're talking about coercive enterprises, there's a lot of other powerful reasons ideational reasons why it is that people hold on to the coercive enterprise. In a lot of ways, that I actually believe if, of, of all the things, if you're ever going to see the whole notion of a coercive enterprise someday become obsolete, that's going to be the last area that will fall. The, the last area. So it's, it's not going to be the first. I can tell you that. I, I, I can tell you, I, I strongly believe there's very few people that you are going to get out of that ideational influence. Uh, you, you will nudge them away through the other three, well, through, the, through two of the others, uh, and maybe possibly a, the third. We'll, we'll get to that. Actually, we'll get to that right now. So the third form of influence is force influence. And force influence is just, just what it sounds like. It's the use of force 
to influence action. Now, force influence is not necessarily bad. I didn't say coercive. I didn't say coercive action. I said force influence. And sometimes force influence is coercive in nature, and sometimes force influence is, is intended to prevent coercive action against you. So I don't know how much I have to dis explain force influence, but let's just say you get pulled over and you're, you're me, you're, 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 say you're speeding and you get, you, you see the sirens behind you. I don't have any belief whatsoever that those sirens behind me are any sort of legitimate authority. I, I don't have any belief whatsoever that uh, ideationally uh, I have any reason to stop for those sirens. None. I have none. I don't really care socially if, if people hate me and want to ostracize me because I refuse to pull over. And, and I'll, I, I, won't, I won't. Okay, so I'll just deal with those. I won't get to the other one. Uh, I do have a reason that I pull over, though. Now, for me. Not, 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 not for most people. I believe most people, when they pull over, it's, it's and or there's some sort of social and or ideational influence that is the primary driver in that conversation. Now, I believe to some degree maybe all four are at play, but I don't believe that this one, that force, is, is the primary driver for them, for most people. For me, it's... it's 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 uh, it's the primary driver. Maybe force and demonstrable is second, but I'll get to demonstrable in a little bit. That's that's the big one that I really want to talk about. But I pull over, and I pull over because I know if I if I don't pull over, what am I going to do? Going to try to outrun the guy or gal, woman. I'm going to try to outrun them. Maybe I have a vehicle that can outrun them. Maybe I don't. I know that there's a pretty good chance that they've seen my license plate. They've documented my license plate. Fairly good chance they can find me. And I have no doubt that, uh, you know, if I try to flee, that they will make a serious effort to try to stop me. I know that they are willing to apply force to stop me. They have determined, because of their laws, that I have broken I've broken their law. Law is just a wish that someone wrote. And uh, the cops, <laughs> they're the ones that make that dream come true. <laughs> and this guy's busy making this dream come true, that somebody wrote a wish. I think that people should pay a price if they're speeding beyond a certain limit at a certain place. I'm going to set up a mechanism that will determine, like, what, time what places get what speed limits whatever but you know i think people should pay a price for that and uh whatever that price is and they write it that's their wish and the cop says i'm gonna make your dreams come true and that's all that cop is doing making the dreams of the of the law writer come true and i know that i understand that most people don't most people don't think about it in that way but for me, I do understand. So force influence is directly, powerfully affecting me. I'm pulling over. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go ahead and pull over. Uh, guy's going to write me a ticket. Depending on what my traffic violation history is, I may receive various levels of penalties. I'm going to receive some sort of fine. I know if I don't pay the fine, there's a fair chance at some point that folks with guns will show up to collect. And I know that uh, there's a chance that if I've done this a number of times that uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get my license suspended. So then if I'm driving and I got caught without my license, I face, I face risk of being kidnapped and thrown in a cage. I understand all this. So the, the force influence is very real very well understood, and very much the key influencer for me in that certain circumstance. What's going on over in Rahava right now? You have Rahava, this great, 
grand experiment in statelessness. They're trying to run a confederal democracy. And I don't quite understand confederal democracy. Maybe uh, that's another show. I don't know if it's Arc Logos or one of the other shows, but that's definitely a show somewhere. Uh, they're, they're trying to govern in a non-coercive manner. The, there, I think there are four cantons in, in the Rahava experiment. Now, one of the cantons is kind of went a little state of state face and got some taxes going on. The other three cantons don't have taxes. So you just, it's voluntary fee payments that, that they're collecting. It's not taxation. It's voluntary fees. Uh, well, the other is re resorted to taxes, so that's another story. But <clears throat> they're, they're doing this peaceful experiment, and <laughs> all around them is violence. And uh, one of the, the uh, enclaves of Rahava, it's not connected to Rahava, it's geographically separated, is Afrin. And Afrin is right now facing direct force influence. Turkey and a lot of the Islamo fascists that were cutting off people's heads and killing kids and doing whatever the crap they do. Uh, and no, I'm not talking about all of Islam in before demonizing Islam. No, no, no. I'm just talking specifically about Islamo fascists. That is, people who have used Islam to try to create some sort of fascist type governance model. Literally, a fascist governance model, hence the term Islamofascist. Uh, but Afrin is, is under direct force threat. The Turks are bombing them. They are shelling them. They are shooting them. They are attempting to influence their action in a violent and, uh, I would call it, vulgar manner. There's, that's that's the most powerful influence that's going on there. Now, what's causing the people with the guns to actually do what the Turks are asking them to do, what the Aslamo fascists are asking them to do? You know, like, I, I, it's probably different for individuals. It's mostly, I would suspect, it's ideationally. A lot of it is social, some demonstrable. But and even to a certain degree, it may be forced, do this or die, and they know this. Uh, but, but regardless, the action that's being taken in aggregate by this force is force, and it is intended to influence action. So force, I think force, force action is pretty easily to understand. Now, on the other side of it, Afrin, using force to try to prevent the Turks from from seizing their territory, from uh, uh, sending the Kurds out of Afrin, they're they're using force influ as well. They're using force the, the force influence as well. They're trying to influence the Turks and the Islamo fascist allies' uh, actions. They want them to cease and desist, to leave them the hell alone, to change their action, their action that they would prefer to take is they'd like to take the land and kick the Kurds out, and the Kurds would like them to change that action, to influence that action, to not take over the area and kick the Kurds out. Now that gets us, that gets us to our last. And I, 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 I've said at the beginning, I am not saying that any one of these spheres of influence are more important than the other. I don't believe anyone is more important than the other. I think it varies from circumstance, from individuals. Uh, but I will say, in terms of advancing the cause of tilting the balance of power towards individuals and free associations, I believe it is the most powerful sphere of influence that, that we who who want to do that, uh, want to do, or, or should, should enter into working. This is, this is the sphere of influence that we have the, the lowest hanging fruit available before us to pick off. There's our, our numbers, uh, uh, they're infinitesimal. 
how many of us are there, we who who are willing, not, not even, I mean, I'm going to make it a pretty broad coalition, if you will, and I'm going to include, I don't care if, if you believe that, okay, a course of enterprise, it's just always going to be. I don't even care if you believe, well, a course of enterprise, not only is it always going to be, it's kind of necessary. If you have it in your head that you believe that, there's, there's nothing wrong, and matter of fact, you would prefer to see the balance of power tilted towards individuals and free associations, always in that direction. And that if, even if you believe that the coercive enterprise is, is necessary, if you begin to see that non-coercive governance can actually meet many of the, many of the needs that you think only a coercive enterprise can meet, uh, that you would actually be willing to go down that path, then I'm talking to you. So this is, I, I want to make this as broad a coalition as possible, but even that broad a coalition, I think there's a lot less of us than people really imagine. I, I don't know, maybe less than 1%. The ability for, for us uh, in aggregate to to uh, exert social influence, I think is infinitesimally small. So I don't think social influence is much much of a tool except among ourselves. <laughs> that this doesn't mean, by the way, all these things that I'm saying, this does not mean that I'm saying that you don't work in those spheres and that we don't try to tilt the balance of power towards individuals and free associations using those forms of influence because certainly locally you have more ability than you know nationwide or worldwide to to use some of these influences so still i don't see social influences being the the most powerful tool then there's ideational influence i think there's a lot of possibilities here even what I do on iState.tv, that's the awareness part. So what I try to do on iState.tv is I, I, prevent, I, I present news. And when I mean news, I, I'm focusing to some degree on politics, uh, a little bit more of a degree. I'm looking at what's going on worldwide. I really focus a lot more on technology. I focus a lot more on technology. And it's interesting how much technology is tied with politics these days. And that's, that's not a surprise. But I, I follow the the model of awareness, hope, and action. Now the action part, that's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about demonstrable influence. That's the action part. But I don't just address demonstrable influence. I even try to use social influence. Like for instance, I'll write articles in which I will call out the writer by name. The person who wrote the article that I may be excerpting from and I may be uh, editorializing, I will call that person out by name. And yes, I will, especially, well, yeah, I'll say as of late, this isn't like this is a go, but lately, especially the gun grabbers, when I see the gun grabber, especially especially news reporters who are attempting to 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 write a piece that they're pulling off as straight news, I really love calling them out. And that's social influence. I am actually I'm trying to shame them, trying to ostracize them, even though it's you know it's a blip. I'm still doing it, so I'm still doing social influence. And ideational influence, yes, and this is in the awareness part. This is absolutely what I try to do. I'm trying to show in these news stories the, the bloodthirsty nature of the type of governance that you are advocating for. Because even though I believe ideationally, I don't think you're going to get, you're not going to reach a lot of people. Most people, 90 plus percent, they're, they're not interested. They're not, they're not living a life of ideas so much as they're living a life of, of what they deem to be usefulness. They, they want to have a comfortable, secure, happy life, and they want to believe that they're going to leave a similar circumstance to their progeny. That's how most people are. That's what most people think. And you're, 
you 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 come up to them and you tell them I want to offer you an idea that at least initially means more responsibility means less security means uh dealing with being socially ostracized i i mean e even me you know i i am significantly limited in my ability to make a living doing a lot of the things that i used to do because of my beliefs because i have chosen to envision the possibility of non-coercive governance. Uh, just because I've done that, I've cut myself off. I've been socially ostracized, if you will. So you're not selling people ideationally something that, un un unless they're driven by, by ideas, I'll say. And I, I don't want to get too too much into this. I could go down a dark rabbit, a, well, not a dark rabbit hole, a very deep rabbit hole analyzing uh, the, the what what compels people to be ideational in nature or or seem to be ideational in nature. But but at least what what appears to be they're ideationally driven. These folks are small, 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 small in number. You're not going to get a whole lot of folks over to your side with this ideationality. So. Uh, that being said, demonstrable influence is, is absolutely a powerful tool. Demonstrable influence is showing something through either success or failure. <laughs> so for instance, I can... I want to go into business and I'm looking around at the type of business models that are out there and I see a number of my friends that have opened up hot dog stands and uh, those hot dog stands have been an absolute disaster. Totally fat. That's going to influence me right away. I don't know. I don't know about that hot dog stand. I go fishing and I'm fishing away and I'm not doing good. I'm not getting a fish. And I look up just the river and some dude's in a water hole and uh, he's popping them fish out left and right. And then the dude leaves. I'm going to say the dude leaves because I'm going to make this simple because if the dude's still there, I may want to go up there, but uh, I may have some social and or force influence in my head, real or imagined, that would prevent me from, from, from entering into his sacred hole of fish. Wow, that's a sense. So... <laughs> I'm, you know, he leaves and that immediately influences my action. Demonstrable influence. That dude was successful at that fishing hole. I'm going to go ahead and change to that fishing hole. Well, we have uh, technology and uh, methods out there. Some of it is, uh, some of it's not new. Some of it's brand new. Some of it's still emerging. That that we can in, enter into and we can work with this technology, with these methodologies, with these types of free associations, that we can work to disentangle ourselves from coercive enterprise products and services and produce for the audience around us success, happiness, prosperity. We can show the audience around us we don't even have to say, hey, listen, man, you really should use the mesh network because this is the best way to advance the, the, the cause of tilting the balance of power towards individuals and free associations. Hey, man, you want to be able to talk freely and not have to worry about the government freaking minding your business? You want to you wanna keep some of your, your money that they're trying to tax and you feel like you're being overburdened? Dude. I know where you can go and you can buy and sell stuff that, uh, yeah, you save a lot of money. You're tired of the public schools and uh, taxation that you have to pay to send your kids to a school that is just training your kid to hate you. Whether that's real or imagined, I'm just saying many people do feel that way. Uh, well, hey, why don't you join this uh, educational cooperative thingy over here and, uh, you know, 
they don't have to be doing it because they are fundamentally against the government, against coercive enterprises, and they have some ideational motivation. Man, I'm going to send my kid to some place. They're going to get a better education. It's going to cost me less money. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they start to do these things and they start to experience non-coercive governance at a very real profound level. And there's, there's many examples uh, out there. There's many opportunities out there. So, uh, I mean, demonstral influence, to, to put it plainly, demonstral influence is success or failure demonstrated, which tends to drive people towards or away from an action. And we have all kinds of, of demonstrable opportunities. And in a lot of ways, demonstrable influence is going to be working in our favor without us trying to do a darn thing. Maybe the only the best thing we can do is highlight the demonstrable influence. Make sure that, that you don't miss it. Document how it is that coercive enterprises are continually taking more and more and more and offering less and less and less. And they have to continually try to control more and more of your lives. Just keep documenting that. And like, okay, I'm not going to, I don't need to document how they're controlling in our lives in an ideational way, although I will to a certain degree. All I got to do is document how it is that that control is costing you more like you're not going to be able to make as much money <laughs> you're not going to have as as many choices to do what you want to do with your life that's demonstrable failure that model is not working it is no longer producing i mean it, it to a certain degree it may still give you the illusion of security but it's it, it, if it begins to be perceived by you that it's no longer offering you opportunities for prosperity or leaving behind uh, an environment in which your progeny can also enjoy prosperity, well, man, you're a lot, you're a lot more likely to try out these alternative uh, products and services that are coming from non-coercive associations free associations, individuals, whatever the case might be. And there you go. I think I think that's it. That is that is my understanding of the nature of power. And I think I'm going to I don't know what I'm going to do the next arc logos. These are going to be uneven. I might do one tomorrow, I might one do one in a month. And I don't know specifically what the topic will be. I have two topics that I have in my head. One of them is the next arc logos might very well be about preference. I've talked about this in various uh, degrees on, on our other shows, and I talked about it actually on the first arc logos to a certain degree as well, but I may go into that in a lot more depth. And uh, this, is, this is part of the Viz Pravusian model in my head, and it is the notion that uh, preference Preference is the the framer of standards that you can use to start to formulate a plan of action in your life that gives you the best opportunity to live the life that you want to live. But uh, standards don't produce preference. That's That's what I might get into. And I have another one that I've actually written an outline for a show a long time ago, and I may get into that one next. I'm not sure. And that is the nature of language itself in which I'm actually going to use scripture to show that when it comes to written words, you are significantly limited in your understanding of written language. And uh, yeah, I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> That might be the next one I do, or I might do preference, or I might talk about the the other side. I might talk about the 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 the, the previous side, the the previous side, the individuals, free associations. Uh, what do I mean by all that? At any rate, I think I'm done here. I'm. I'll see how this experiment went. This is the first time I did a Twitter Twitter podcast. I noted. Uh, I think. Uh, Andrew Marich Bodie noted that for some reason it's showing my quote-unquote real name. 
Uh, I go by the name Paul Gordon. I'll continue to go by the name Paul Gordon. But yes, my last name is Collier. But yeah, I prefer Paul Gordon. And uh, I don't care, though, if people see my name, Paul, Gord Paul Collier. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care about that either way either. So uh, this has been Paul Gordon of iState.tv. And this has been, I guess, the third episode of the Arc Logos podcast. Thank you for joining me and uh, have a wonderful Super Bowl Sunday if you're watching this on Super Bowl. If you're watching this after Super Bowl Sunday, have a wonderful day anyway.